Um, in this talk, we're going to talk about how to evaluate <clears throat> breast cysts that are not simple. Uh, we're going to talk about why cysts look the way they do and whether or not we should worry about them. In most cases, we don't worry about them. I'm going to show some pathologic images in color. Then I will convert them to grayscale and video invert, so uh, white is black and black is white. And then convert them back to color and it'll help you understand what you're seeing. Now, the percentage of breast cysts we see today that is not simple is higher than it used to be for a couple of reasons. One reason is that we've um, pushed our scan parameters, our frequency, our bandwidth, our dynamic range so far that we're creating a haze artifact within the cysts. But the second is that the resolution of ultrasound has gotten better and better as the frequency has gotten higher and that we're seeing real things inside uh, cysts that we didn't used to be able to see. So, uh, you know, while only a small percentage of cysts might have appeared not simple 20 years ago, a much larger percentage appears not to be simple today. Now, in the ACR BiRADS ultrasound lexicon, we have complicated cysts that are more typically going to be benign. Complicated cysts have internal echoes in the cyst fluid. It could be a, a fat fluid level, a debris level, scintillating echoes, uh, uh, and even, even dependent calcifications. These are usually going to be BiRADS 2 if they're multiple and incidental, or BiRADS 3 if they're a dominant clinical or mammographic feature. Um, we don't call complex uh, cystic masses anymore. We call them complex cystic and solid masses. Now, these can be BiRADS 3, but are more likely to be BiRADS 4, uh, 4 or 5. Now, uh, complex cystic and solid are described as they are by virtue of having mural nodules or thick septations or irregular wall thickenings. We still have a small percentage today that we can't tell whether they're cystic or solid. These are indeterminate. Uh, they're usually going to be complicated cysts that have fluid so echogenic that they, they appear to be mildly hypochoic solid masses. But in my experience, uh, about 3% of the time, we still can't determine whether or not we have um, uh, a complicated cyst or a solid mass in some cases. Now, what we worry about being in non-simple uh, cysts are papillomas and carcinomas. But what it usually is is protein globs, cholesterol crystals, fat, globu fat globules, white cells, red cells, epithelial cells, foamy macrophages, individual apocrine cells, and papillary apocrine metaplasia, which I've uh, abbreviated uh, PAM. Now, what is fibrocystic change? Well, what I'm showing here on the top is a short axis view of a, of a normal TDLU, and the bottom is a long axis view. The ED stands for extralobular terminal duct. And an average TDLU has 50 or 60 acini within it. And if the acini are not cystically dilated, we just, you know, we just see what looks like a small tennis racket, with the head being the, the lobular or TDLU, and the handle being the extralobular terminal duct. Now in fibrocystic chains, the acini begin to become cystically dilated, and the walls between them eventually efface. So on the bottom, we're seeing a long axis uh, microcystic TDLU where we can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe eight cystically dilated acini in this plane, an extralobular terminal duct and an intralobular terminal duct, and the normally loose gray stromal, uh, intralobular stromal fibrous tissue has become uh, white, the fibro part of fibrocystic change. As the degree of Fibrocystic change increases, the number of acini that remain um, decrease, and they become larger. Uh, and finally, after all the walls between the acini uh, become ruptured or effaced, uh, we can wind up with a simple uh, tension cyst. And this usually happens because of twisting of the extra lab of the terminal duct, which you can see shown by the black arrow on the right. Now on the far left end, where we have normal TDLUs, and on the far right, where if we have unilocular simple cyst, those are clearly benign uh, or normal on ultrasound. But in the middle, where we have these micro cysts, is where uh, spatial resolution matters. Um, if I intentionally defocus B and C, 
it can look like these micro cysts with white fibrous tissue if you if you volume average black cyst in, in micro black fluid in micro cysts with white fibrous tissue you can make this look like an isocoic mural nodule on the left or on the right a thickened isocoic septation and so this is where the quality of the machine matters the the better the quality of the machine the higher the frequency the better the spatial resolution the more often we can resolve micro cysts and say these are benign the lower the quality the more likely it does appear to be uh, a mural nodule or a thickened septation so um, I think lower end machines don't necessarily cause false negatives, but they can cause false positives in these non-simple breast cysts. Now, one of the things that makes our life difficult is that the estrogen receptors are not necessarily evenly distributed in the asinine. So I'm showing you a single TDLU here, and the brown stain represents estrogen positive asinine. You can see that they're microcystically dilated. But we can see others in the middle that are blue and don't have the brown stain uh, that are estrogen negative and they don't become cystically dilated enough for them us to see them. So what can happen is you can get a mixture of um, microcysts and and asini that are not dilated and it can make it look complex cystic uh, and solid rather than um, simple clustered microcysts. Now these are clustered simple cysts, and we don't have any problem calling them benign. Um, they're virets too, we don't worry about them. But when we get microcysts, they can appear to be complex cystic and solid microcysts for several reasons. One reason is that you can have proteinaceous or fatty fluid within the microcysts that make them appear to, to be similar to microlobulated solid masses. You can have papillary apical metaplasia within the microcysts, which can make them look complex cystic and solid. And you can have the uneven uh, distribution of estrogen receptors, which I showed you earlier. But in a small percentage of cases, you can have micropapillary uh, carcinoma in situ or micropapillary DAB giving rise to the echoes. Luckily, about 99% of the time, these complex cystic uh, microcysts, complex cystic and solid microcysts, are going to be due to one of the three benign causes, and only about 1% of the time are they going to be uh, due to micropapillary DAB. Now, these are cyst fluids that were aspirated from benign breast cysts in a, in a good book on benign breast disease by Hughes and Mansell, and notice that they vary greatly in color. Now, if I make this grayscale video invert so gray is, uh, uh, white is black, black is white, we can see that they vary greatly in opacity. Now, opacity is not identical to echogenicity, but it's analogous to echogenicity. So let's just do some what ifs. So if I say, what if the two mid opaque um, samples on the right represent simple breast cysts, then what do these two that are denser uh, then simple cysts contain. Well, they have to have something in the fluid. It's not dense enough to be calcium, but it could be proteinaceous fluid. So proteinaceous uh, debris within the fluid can make the fluid appear echogenic uh, rather than anechoic. And if we look at these two, they're less dense than the isodense uh, two specimens on the right. So there has to be something in the fluid that's making them less dense. Well, it's not air. It's not that um, non-dense. So it has to be suspended fat. So basically what we're seeing here is that the change in color and the differences in opacity and echogenicity are related to either proteinaceous debris or um, fatty contents floating within uh, the cyst fluid. Now how does this happen? Well I think all simple cysts what appear to be simple cysts on ultrasound at any rate, have some element of proteinaceous debris and or fatty debris within them. And most cysts are acute, about 80% are resolved spontaneously, but about 20% can become chronic. And when they become chronic, what can happen is that the fluid, the water, can be resorbed through the cyst wall over time. And whatever proteinaceous and or fatty contents were in the cyst, uh, become more concentrated and therefore can create echoes. So uh, what I'm showing you 
in this simple cyst uh, seen on a baseline is that it's anechoic. Now, she was being followed for a fibroadenoma on a different part of the breast. This was just followed, incidentally. Notice that at five months when she came back for her quote-unquote six-month follow-up of the fibroadenoma elsewhere in her breast, it's still anechoic. <clears throat> but at, under one year, <clears throat> if the cyst is a little smaller and she's now developed internal echoes uh, within the fluid. So what's happening is that the proteinaceous and or fatty contents have become concentrated over time as the fluid gets resorbed through the cyst wall, but the proteinaceous or fatty contents can't. So these are uh, benign breast cysts that every pathologist would just call benign fibrocystic change. These are the video inverted uh, grayscale images of the histology images. And these are the ultrasound images that correspond. And you can see why um, it's useful to uh, convert the pathology images to grayscale and then video invert them. So on the left, we have a cyst that has low levels of proteinaceous debris within it, but it has a thin, bright wall and anechoic fluid on ultrasound. So that's a simple cyst. Um, second from the left, has more concentrated proteinaceous debris within it, but remains with a thin, bright wall. And that's a complicated cyst with uh, low level echoes due to proteinaceous debris within it. Um, second from the right is a single layer of apricot metaplasia. Now apricot uh, excretes fat into the cell, so now we've got protein, uh, we've got fatty uh, contents within the cyst fluid, creating some low-level echoes within the cyst fluid, and the wall appears to be slightly more gray and slightly thicker because it's got a layer of apricot metaplasia instead of a thin, flat epithelium. And on the right, we have an irregular uh, papillary apricot metaplasia. PAM, so-called PAM, and fatty contents within the fluid. So here we've got uh, echogenic fluid due to fatty contents, and we've got an irregular uh, isochoic wall thickening due to the apricot uh, metaplasia, papillary apricot metaplasia. So basically, we have a simple cyst on the left. We have complicated cysts in the middle. And on the right, it's... Uh, it's a combination of complicated by virtue of echogenic fluid and complex cystic and solid by virtue of irregular isochoic wall thickening. So as is the usual case when we have a mixture of uh, ultrasound features, we go by the mo most suspicious feature we see, so we call the one on the right complex. Now, I mentioned that part of the reason that we see a higher percentage of cysts being non-simple today is artifacts. And so what we want to do is make sure we eliminate artifacts. And so the number one tool we have to avoid uh, artifactual echoes is to make sure we have no volume averaging or minimize volume averaging. We can also use digitally encoded harmonics and spatial compounding to minimize internal artifact. Um, and so that'll help us distinguish real from artifactual internal echoes. So here's a case where it looks like we have a solid, tiny, uh, mass or nodule um, in the very near field, uh, about five millimeters deep. But notice where our focal zone is. It's out of focus. So we're not minimizing our volume averaging in this case. If I put two focal zones in and move my focal zones up, we can see that these are simply clustered microcysts, simple clustered microcysts. So what could have been by reds four with uh, poor focusing uh, can be resolved as a bi-reds too with good focal zone positioning. Here I'm showing sp uh, split screen images of a complicated cyst with fundamental imaging on the left and harmonics on the right. Notice that the harmonics has cleared out most of the internal echoes. And here we've got a lot of clutter in the cyst on the left with conventional imaging, whereas with spatial compounding, we can clear most of that uh, clutter artifact out of the cyst. So it turns out that in the old days, you could only have harmonics or uh, spatial compounding uh, and only on a high-end machine. Now, even mid-range and, and even lower-end machines can have both spatial compounding and harmonics. And we like to use both of them because they clear uh, echoes out uh, by uh, different mechanisms. So my default presets for uh, breast ultrasound always are to have spatial compounding uh, and uh, tissue harmonics on. Now, there are general rules for 
non-simple breast cysts, and they are generally pre pretty reassuring. Um, the majority of non-simple uh, breast cysts are part of that huge spectrum that we call fibrocystic change. Malignant breast cysts are relatively infrequent, and the unusual malignant breast cyst is almost always obviously a, mal a malignant solid mass uh, with cystic or hemorrhagic degeneration. It's really only in the rarest of circumstances that we would be tricked um, by a, a malignant breast cyst. However, those are general rules, and general rules are great for populations, but not necessarily individuals. <clears throat> and if you've ever taken care of doctors, doctors' wives, or nurses, you know that they tend to be the exception to the rule. And if you tell somebody, look, there's a less than a 1% chance or a 1 in 1,000 chance that this is malignant, they'll say, yeah, but it would be me. I'm always the exception to the rule. So general rules are uh, reassuring for populations, not necessarily for individual patients. So you still need a systematic way of evaluating these non-simple breast cysts. Now, developing an algorithm uh, for assessing non-simple breast cysts was, was difficult because the reference standard for cysts was much less um, solid or much less quality or lower quality than was the reference standard for solid masses because histology is a pretty good reference standard. But for non-simple breast cysts, it was either... Uh, cyst aspiration and fluid cytology, which has both too many false positives and too many false negatives, or follow-up, in which most cases the patient just was lost to follow-up and you didn't really get it back. Um, even when you had a surgical removal of, of these non-simple breast cysts, the cyst was often ruptured in the process of removing it or histologically preparing it. What might have been the dominant clinical or mammographic feature um, could have been misinterpreted <clears throat> as um, background process. So it really wasn't to the advent of ultrasound uh, directed um, vacuum assisted biopsy that we could specifically remove the part that we were worried about and develop a, a logical way of evaluating these. Now what we didn't want to do is reinvent the wheel. So we wanted to use algorithms that we used for mammography and for solid breast masses as much as possible uh, and apply them to cysts. And what that involved is looking for suspicious findings first. And if we saw any suspicious findings, the whole lesion was suspicious. If we found no suspicious findings, then we would look for definitively benign findings. If we couldn't find definitively benign findings, then we would, as a um, fallback thing, put them, try to put them into BIRADS 3, which wasn't the ideal situation. And if we couldn't do that, then it came back to being suspicious and it had to be biopsy. And again, this is similar to the way we look at mammograms or solid masses, so it was not reinventing the wheel. So what are the suspicious findings that we would look for? They're, they're basically things that in BIRADS make a cyst complex cystic and solid rather than complicated, and that includes neural nodules, irregular wall thickening, <clears throat> thick isoacceptations, and a vascular stalk, and then certain complex clustered micro cysts. So here's a cluster of simple cysts. And notice they have a thin, bright wall between them. And if we look at the subgross histology, what we're seeing here is a cluster of microcysts, with each microcyst representing a cystically dilated acinus. And the thin, bright wall uh, um, or septum between them actually representing the intact acinar wall. So I'm showing one, two, three on the ultrasound. Those are three separate um, cystically dilated acini. And the thin, bright septation is simply the unruptured wall of the bordering acinite. On the, hand, on the right, however, we have an isochoic thicken septation. That's much more suspicious. Could it just be apricot metaplasia? Sure. Could it be fibrosclerosis? Sure. But it could also be DCIS, as it was in this case, or intracystic carcinoma. So thin, bright septations are reassuring, uh, similar to clustered macrocysts. Um, these represent clustered microcysts. Um, and a, a thick isoacoacceptation is more suspicious. Now, we've talked about how complex cystic and solid is generally more suspicious than complicated, but if you thought that most complex cystic and solid were uh, papilloma or carcinoma, that would be wrong because most of the time it's apricot metaplasia. So if we want to think about it logically, you know, we can use uh, the chicken versus the egg argument to say which came first. And I think in most cases what comes first is the papillary lesion 
which by a combination of secreting fluid and obstructing the duct, uh, creates the cyst uh, distal to itself. So the key thing is where this thing appears to attach to the wall or where it extends into the ducts, usually toward the nipple, um, as opposed to the surface of the um, neural nodule, say, that uh, is, is bordered by fluid. So really the best point for us to evaluate is where the quote-unquote mural nodule or eccentric wall thickening appears to be attached. And notice that in this case we've got an absent wall and we've got some growth into uh, several ducts toward the nipple. So this is the key point. You know, is that irregular? Is there a thin capsule there? Is there a duct extension or branch pattern? So here we have a complex cystic and solid mass that represents African metaplasia. Notice that we've got a thin, uh, bright <clears throat> a capsule or wall all along the point of attachment. That's reassuring. That's more likely to be African metaplasia. On the other hand, on the right, we have an absent wall where it appears to be attached and we have some regularity or extension into ducts um, at the level where it appears to be attached. So that's suspicious. Again, here we have a complex cystic and solid that's probably 75% filled with solid material. This is apricot metaplasia. It remains confined to an oval or round shape. Whereas on the right, again, we have a, a keyhole kind of a shape where we have an extension uh, outside a round or oval shape into a keyhole or where this is growing up the duct. And so here's a papillary lesion. And again, we can see that we have this extension into the duct, usually toward the nipple uh, in a keyhole configuration. So <clears throat> the presence of this uh, extension into a duct is suspicious uh, for a true papillary lesion as opposed to just apricot metaplasia, which tend not to do that. Now, here I've got a complex cystic and solid mass by virtue of an irregular wall thickening. You can see that I have an absent capsule on the left. Uh, and it extends into the surrounding tissue quite a ways. Notice that there are microlobulations, and within the center of each microlobulation is a microcalcication. This is the classical low power or subgross morphology of DCIS, so this is going to be an intracystic DCIS, but it's extending quite a bit into the surrounding tissue. Here again, we have a small nodule, and again, we have an absent uh, capsule at the point of attachment, and then we have extension into the um, enlarged surrounding ducts. So again, in this case, the bulk of what's going on is actually occurring outside the lesion. So we don't want to just look at the mural nodule or the eccentric wall thickening, uh, but we want to note whether there's an absent capsule where it's attached and how extensively uh, the uh, ducts in the surrounding tissue uh, are involved. Notice that when I get large um, ducts in the surrounding tissue, I've got about a 40% chance of cancer, so that's sort of a high 4B uh, PPV. But when I get enlarged ducts with microcalcifications, then I'm talking you know, almost by reds 5. This is high 4C uh, PPV. Again, what I'm pointing out here is that the real answer may not be inside. The real answer of what's going on and the likelihood of of a malignancy <clears throat> might be a, uh, better reflected by what's happening in the surrounding ducts than what's happening inside the cyst. <coughs> now, vascularity can be helpful, mostly in a positive way. As usual, we can't necessarily trust the negative Doppler very much. But papillary apricot metaplasia gets all of its nutrients and gets rid of all of its waste via passive diffusion. Papillary apicon metaplasia is usually just two cells wide. Uh, it doesn't develop a fibrovascular stalk unless the papillary apicon metaplasia uh, develops on a pre existing papillary lesion. On the other hand, intracystic papilloma and intracystic carcinoma are some of the most vascular lesions in the, in the breast. So if we see internal vascularity, we should be suspicious that it's papilloma or intracystic carcinoma. Whereas if we don't see internal vascularity, you know, it doesn't mean it's not those things. Uh, but a positive Doppler is always more helpful than negative. So here's a mural nodule that's got a branching vascular stalk. This means almost certainly that it's not just apricot metaplasia, that it's truly a papilloma or 
uh, carcinoma. Notice that here's a complex cystic and solid lesion with apocrine and metaplasia, and there's no internal vascularity in it. And remember, vascular stalk is part of the histologic definition of papillary lesions. They, they tend to have a fibrovascular stalk on histologic definition. Now, once we've decided that there is internal vascularity and that it's a true intracystic papillary lesion, we can't really tell whether it's carcinoma or papilloma very much. Um, but single uh, feeding stalk or, or a single branching uh, vascular stalk would tend to favor b benign, whereas multiple uh, feeding vessels uh, would tend to favor malignant. Because if there is going to be invasion, you, can't, you know, you can't invade fluid. The invasion is inward into the fibrovascular stalk, and then when neovascularity develops, you get multiple feeding vessels. Now, we talked about how certain clustered microcysts can fake us out, um, and then we talked about how proteinaceous or fatty fluid or papillary epigrammetoplasia or uneven distribution of um, estrogen receptors in the asini can give you a complex cystic and solid appearance. But we mentioned how, you know, maybe one out of a thousand of these might be micropapillary DAB. And so here I've shown histology, 3D thick section, large section histology by Tabar of micropapillary DAB on the left and a papillary epigrammetoplasia metaplasia on the right. If I convert them to grayscale, you can see that they look fairly similar. And when I put them up uh, side by side, ultrasound um, uh, of micropapillary DAB on the left and a papillary epigrammetoplasia on the right, you can see that it can be it can be difficult to distinguish them apart. Here's an example of a 14 millimeter palpable uh, lump that was complex uh, cystic, uh, a complex microcystic lesion. Um, and uh, when she came back, she, she was, uh, you know, told that it was Biareds 3, she should come back in six months, but uh, to come back sooner if it changed. Well, at seven weeks, it had gone from 14 to 33 millimeters. Uh, and uh, obvious uh, difference here. And then at uh, 10 weeks, when she came in for surgery, it had already gone to 50 millimeters. So it went 14 uh, millimeters to 50 millimeters in a matter of 10 weeks. What wasn't done on the baseline examination is she was not uh, looked at with Doppler. So on the second exam, at seven weeks when I examined her, I put on Doppler, and you can see there's a ton of internal uh, vascularity. But again, Apricot metaplasia virtually never develops internal vascularity. Um, it, you know, it's, uh, this favors it being a, a true papillary lesion, either papilloma or carcinoma. Now, um, you have to be aware that uh, the tumor vessels in papillary lesions are very soft and compressible, and uh, the transducer's hard, the chest wall's hard. If you use uh, too much pressure, you can create a false negative. So this is that same lesion on the seven-week follow-up when I did the examination. And just letting the, the weight of my uh, arm rest on this transducer, I could obliterate virtually all the internal flow. But if I scan very lightly so that I was barely touching the skin enough that I was even getting a little um, air trapping and gel standoff on the left, you can see clearly the entire internal part of this is, is made up of vascularity. So... Um, if you want to assess whether there's internal vascularity and you want to use it to help you decide a true papillary lesion from apricot metaplasia, you want to scan with very light uh, scan pressure. Now, the, this is a case that I scanned in the Akron 6666 um, ultrasound study. And this was just called benign clustered microcysts. And what we're seeing on this power Doppler is simply a normal a blood vessel just passing by. This is not internal. Um, when you do a video sweep across here, you can see that this vessel has nothing to do with the complex uh, or with the simple clustered microcysts. It's just a vessel passing by in the surrounding tissue. As opposed to the um, case that I just showed you that, uh, where they grew from 14 to uh, 50 millimeters in 10 weeks, this is a grade 3 a micropapillary DAV. Now, can you get false positives? You can because um, the fatty fluid within these clustered microcysts that was excreted into the cysts by the apricot metaplasia can cause a chemical mastitis if there's a slight rent in the epithelial lining of these clustered microcysts. 
Now the fat comes in the contact with the surrounding tissue, it can cause a chemical mastitis. So this is the baseline um, BIREDS 2 simple clustered microcysts um, that I called uh, during the Akron 66 study. Five weeks later, she returned with redness and tenderness in the area and noticed that the fat in front of these clustered microcysts is abnormally echogenic, so there's edema there. And notice how much hyperemia she's developed in and surrounding these, um, th these uh, clustered microcysts. So she's developed a secondary inflammation. These are inflamed clustered microcysts, spontaneous. Uh, uh, but you, you can see that you can get some false positives. Now once we decide that non-simple breast cysts are more likely to be uh, a true papillary lesion than just apricot metaplasia, cytology is not good enough. We can't just aspirate the fluid and rely on that um, because we have too many false positives and, any, and uh, false negatives. And if we do get atypical um, cells, it may be hard to find the lesion once we've aspirated it. So I don't like to aspirate these. If, if I'm concerned about a papillary lesion, I like to go straight to outside and get it back in assisted biopsy. So here's a complex cystic solid mass with a mural nodule on the posterior wall. Here's the vacuum probe uh, underneath it. And what I'm going to do is use the vacuum probe to remove everything up to the front wall of the cyst. And then I'll always deploy a marker. So if I uh, get atypical or malignancy, you know, I, I can always get back to the area for localization. Now, is there anything other than papilloma carcinoma we're concerned about? And that, that's uh, possibly infection. So we can see inflammation in non simple breast cysts, and they usually present with three findings uniform iso quote, quote unquote wall thickening, which is usually pericystic thickening, a debris level, which is pus, and hyperemia of the cyst wall. And again, a cyst wall in quotes because it's usually pericystic hyperemia. So on the right is what a typical uh, simple cyst looks like with a thin bright wall and on the left is what an acutely inflamed cyst looks like with uniform quote-unquote iso quote wall thickening and a debris level which represents layered pus. In fact this um, pericystic inflammation is often plasma cells or foamy macrophages uh, attracted to the surrounding area uh, by leakage of uh, fatty fluid uh, out of these cysts. Again, on the right is a non-inflamed simple cyst, uh, and on the left is an acutely inflamed uh, cyst. Again, the hyperemia appears to be within the um, so-called isocoque uh, thickened wall, which is in fact pericystic fluid. Uh, so um, hyperemia, typical of that. Now, it's interesting that in an inflamed cyst, the uh, vascularity that we see on Doppler tends to be parallel to the cyst wall and actually outside the cyst wall of the pericystic fluid. Whereas the vascularity um, supplying an intracystic papillary lesion like papilloma carcinoma is usually just passing through the wall and is often oriented perpendicular to the cyst wall. So the, the orientation of the vessel can be very helpful in assessing uh, the worrisomeness of this. Now, do we ever see parallel stuff in, in a malignancy? We, we can. This is a triple negative uh, grade three invasive ductal cancer with extensive hemorrhagic necrosis and so basically the entire inside of this is liquefied or hemorrhagic and all that's left is the uh, the, the vessels that are in the uh, what appear to be in the pericystic area so this would be a case where you could get a false negative because you'd say well this is typical uh, orientation for um, uh, uh, an inflamed cyst but uh, again this doesn't happen very often now, we showed you the case where um, we followed that simple cyst. At five months, it remains simple. At, uh, at 12 months, uh, it's a little smaller, and the fluid, uh, the, the proteinaceous or fatty fluid within it has become more concentrated and echogenic. And then uh, at uh, two years, we can see that we have uniform isocoic wall thickening and a debris level where it represents pus. And we have hyperemia in the pericystic fluid. So you can see how over time the fatty contents became more concentrated as the, as the uh, water was absorbed through the cyst wall. And then eventually the cyst became inflamed. Now when we aspirate these acutely inflamed cysts, we wind up with residual pericystic uh, thickening, usually foamy macrophages. Uh, and so um, 
you know, we're always going to have residual wall thickening when we aspirate an acutely inflamed cyst. We're going to get pus out of it. If I, if I come in under ultrasound guidance in a way that avoids this pericystic hyperemia, I'm just going to get yellow pus. Uh, whereas if I don't use ultrasound guidance and I come through these vessels in the cyst wall, then I'm more likely to get uh, bloody pus. Now, this is uniform isocoke wall thickening in a non-acutely inflamed cyst. Uh, this is actually a thick fibrous walled cyst. And this uh, can be indistinguishable from an acutely inflamed cyst because it basically represents the healed phase of an acutely inflamed cyst. So this once upon a time was acutely inflamed, but it's healed with fibrosis in the cyst wall. It's not tender and there's no hyperemia on Doppler. Now the debris level within these inflamed cysts can be very viscous. So when you put the patient, uh, you know, here she is supine, and I'm scanning um, transverse. And now I've rolled her left lateral cube, and for at two minutes, this fluid debris level is just beginning to shift. At three minutes, a little more, and it really is until five minutes that this very thick, viscous fluid has redistributed into the uh, new dependent position. So if you want to, if you want to distinguish tumefactive sludge or pus from a true mural nodule eccentric wall thickening, you may have to wait a few minutes because it, it can be a very slow shift. Now, this is a case where we have tumefactive sludge, but it looks like a mural nodule. Now, one thing I can do is I can use power Doppler uh, vocal fremitus. So, um, what I'm doing is having the patient home in a deep voice with a um, power Doppler <coughs> using a yellow <coughs> or orange map. And we can see that the uh, fremitus is creating artifactual vibration of the breast tissues. But the fact that the uh, vibration is not going into what appears to be a mural nodule means it's not attached. So in fact, without having to wait five minutes, I'm proving in this particular case that this is not attached. This is tumefactive sludge or pus. And we can see that if I do wait 10 minutes, then I can eventually show that this shifts to the new uh, position. Now, here's a case where we have hemorrhagic intracystic papillary lesion. And so I'm using power Doppler vocal fremitus, and we can see that this part vibrates and turns orange, indicating that this is attached to the cyst wall. And this part on the right is not turning orange, meaning it's not attached. So this is the hemorrhage inside the cyst. So we've got a combination of an attached mural nodule and a hemorrhagic component, uh, uh, component inside the cyst that isn't attached. Again, this is a typical pus being aspirated from a, a, an inflamed cyst where we've used ultrasound guidance, uh, a Doppler guidance to avoid these pericystic inflammatory vessels. And here's a case where uh, we weren't careful enough uh, with our uh, Doppler guidance, and we went through one of those vessels and got hemorrhagic pus. So, um, you know, we'd rather get plain old pus than hemorrhagic pus, because if we just get plain old pus, we're not worried about tumor. We're just worried about inflammation uh, versus infection, and we can just get a gram staining culture, and we don't need to get cytology or flow cytometry. On the other hand, if we get hemorrhagic, then uh, we're more likely to have to um, run a lot of extra analysis on it uh, for not much gain. Now, once we decide that there's no intracystic papillary lesion and that um, uh, there's no signs of inflammation, then we can look for definitively benign findings. They're mostly things that in ACR by red salt sound lexicon would give us a complicated rather than a complex cystic or solid mass. So in this case, I'm showing scintillating echoes or streaming or streaking echoes just using the acoustic radiation force of the grayscale image. Now in general, I have to turn up the transmit power to get this because ultrasound machines uh, with uh, because of ALARA regulations, as low as reasonably acceptable, uh, usually uh, boot up at uh, low default uh, power. So in this case, I've manually turned up the transmit power in order to create this uh, scintillating echoes. A simpler thing to do is just turn on color power Doppler because the energy of color power Doppler is much greater than a grayscale ultrasound, even at maximum transmit power. So um, here we're seeing a case that looks like it might have a mural nodule attached. 
and I've turned the transmit power up and I'm getting no motion. It looks like maybe there's a mural nodule attached to the interior wall. But when I put on color Doppler, we can see that those are just scintillating echoes. But there was not enough energy in the grayscale of sound to make them move. So this just shows that, in general, it's not worth fooling around with the transmit power. Uh, on these cases, it's better just turn on color power Doppler. Now there are some tricks you can use. Here I'm showing that, yes, I'm getting scintillating echoes when I use an open uh, color box. But on the right, when I narrow the color box, I'm concentrating the energy in a narrow area. Notice how much faster these echoes move. So um, the more viscous the fluid, uh, the more likely you're going to have to narrow the color box to get the movement that you're looking for. Now, what uses even more power uh, than um, color power Doppler is Sherwood elastography. So here we can see two things. We can see that there's no uh, transmission of shear waves into the cyst, and that, that's uh, indicating that it's, that it's just echogenic fluid. And we can also see these particles being driven backwards um, by the uh, acoustic radiation force of the shear wave. So basically, uh, the least viscous fluid can be moved with grayscale with the power up, and then less, a uh, little more viscous can be moved uh, by uh, color or power Doppler with the box open. And if the fluid is more uh, viscous, you might have to narrow down your color blocks to focus your energy more. And finally, the most viscous fluid might be moved by shear wave, but not by color or power Doppler. When you aspirate these complicated uh, cysts with scintillating echoes, um, you get negative cytology and flow cytometry. But if you look under polarized light, you can see these birefringent crystals, which we think are cholesterol crystals. So we believe that these scintillating echoes are just cholesterol crystals. Now, fat fluid levels are pretty uncommon in mammography. We see them typically with uh, galactoseals, but they're ex extremely common on ultrasound, so it's not unusual to have uh, pretty severe fibrocystic change where you could have five or ten of these uh, fat fluid levels on both sides. So uh, here I've got the patient supine, and the echogenic fatty contents have floated to the anterior non-dependent part of the cyst. When I put her upright while scanning in a longitudinal view, after five minutes, you can see that the um, fat fluid level has shifted into a new not dependent position. When we aspirate these, you don't actually see a white fat layer because the fat gets emulsified coming through the needle. Um, but if you, if you allow this uh, aspirated fluid to sit upright on a shelf for about 30 minutes, a little white fat layer will, will come out. Now we call these acorn cysts because the echogenic um, fluid um, simulates the cap on an acorn. But you can also get an acorn appearance from um, papillary trigon metaplasia. So here's a case where we have an acorn cyst appearance. This is longitudinal while the patient's upright. But when I put her uh, supine, there's no shift. This is, this is firmly attached to the wall, so it's never going to shift no longer how long I wait. So, this is an acorn cyst caused by apricot metaplasia. Now, just as I mentioned that debris levels can be very slow to shift, fat fluid levels can be slow to shift. So here I'm scanning longitudinal, she's upright, and we can see about two-thirds of this cyst is filled with uh, echogenic uh, floating non-dependent uh, fatty contents. But when I put her supine, nothing happens uh, immediately. And then at one minute, it's beginning to shift, two minutes a little more, three minutes a little more, but it isn't five minutes. Uh, it takes five minutes for it to shift to the new non-dependent position. This is a problem because fat fluid levels are really far more common than the debris levels. And if somebody had five of these in either side and you had to take five minutes to wait for each of these to shift, you could spend, you know, an hour and a half diddling around proving these are just benign uh, breast cysts with fat fluid levels. So we need to think about uh, shortcuts. So shortcut number one is that the configuration of a fat fluid level in the process of transitioning is obliquely oriented with respect to the tabletop or the floor and sigmoid in shape, convex posteriorly, concave anteriorly. So this is the, the shortcut way of proving this is just a fat fluid level. This is the absolute common configuration of these in the process of shifting. And for efficient sonographers, they frequently see this because the patient's upright in the waiting room, 
And then uh, she comes in the room, and if you scan her very efficiently, you've scanned her before it's had time to shift to its new uh, non-dependent position. All of these are fat fluid levels that we're in the process of shifting. They're all obliquely oriented, and they're all S-shaped, convex posteriorly, concave anteriorly, in terms of the interface between the floating, floating equigenic fat and the more anechoic fluid. Now here's two acorn cysts side by side. And here I'm not waiting uh, five minutes. I'm using the power Doppler fremitus. So we can see that the one on the right, the fremitus is transmitting into the cyst, indicating that this is firmly attached. So this could be a papilloma or it could just be papil papilabic and metaplasia. But the one on the left, there's no transmission of fremitus into the cyst. And so this is just a fat fluid level. So I can tell instantly with fremitus which is um, complicated, the one on the left and which is complex cystic solid, the one on the right that has attached uh, material. Now, milk of calcium is a type of complicated cyst. Uh, milk of calcium are these tiny little samomatous calcifications which are too small to resolve individually. So what I'm seeing here is probably 50 or 60 tiny samomatous calcifications. And when I have the patient uh, rotate Eventually, this slowly crawls down into a new not dependent position. So that's one type of calcification, uh, the samomatous calcifications, uh, milk of calcium, uh, but we're showing that it shifts. Uh, this corresponds to the teacup on a horizontal beam mammography. Now, there's another type of calcification <coughs> that are larger called calcium oxalate crystals. And these are actually like tiny gallstones. We can actually see, uh, we can resolve them individually and we can show that they shift to a new non-dependent position or a new dependent position when we put the patient into a left lateral decubitus position. And just to show you, this is uh, uh, me scanning transversely as I roll the patient uh, from her back to her side. And you can see that these um, Calcium oxalate crystals move more quickly than um, do the um, uh, semomatous calcifications in milk of calcium. And they're showing up well because they're, you know, birefringent, I mean, they're bipyramidal in shape, and so they're basically square like uh, digital voxels. So we see them pretty well on all sem. So you can get combinations of milk of calcium and calcium oxalate. So here we've got two discrete larger calcifications as well as layered uh, samomatous calcs. So they can occur together. Now in general, mammography can show smaller and more numerous calcifications and it's better for characterizing um, calcifications and ultrasound. But occasionally uh, you'll get suspicious calcifications on a mammogram, mildly suspicious calcifications on a mammogram, uh, where we can more definitively say they're benign uh, on ultrasound. And that's when we get um, this combination of um, calcium oxalate and, and milk of calcium in clustered microcysts. So here I'm just doing a video sweep, and you can see that in, in the bottom of many of these microcysts are dependent um, milk of calcium and or calcium oxalate crystals. Now, uh, cysts that arise from the skin are benign, whether they're completely within the skin, whether they're mostly subcutaneous with a claw of sign of skin wrapping around it, or whether they uh, appear to be entirely subcutaneous, but you can see a gland neck or hair follicle into which they drain. Notice that all of these cases I've had to use a gel standoff. This is one of the ultimate near field um, uh, focusing issues, and, and it's virtually always necessary to use a gel standoff, sometimes um, slightly obliquely oriented in order to best show these. But these are typically sebaceous cysts or epidermal inclusion cysts, simply depending on whether there's been squamous metaplasia in the fundus of the gland. Now, I mentioned that 3% of the time we have indeterminate lesions. We can't tell whether they're complicated cysts with echogenic fluid or solid nodules. In general, the fibroadenomas tend to be a little more echogenic and more oval-shaped and more, more likely to have normal sound transmission. And in general, the complicated cysts tend to be rounder, slightly more hypocal, and have more enhanced through transmission. But that's just a general rule. And in any individual case, it can be very difficult to uh, make uh, the distinction. So what we have to do in these cases are try to clear the internal artifact with good focusing and 
uh, spatial compounding and harmonics. We can turn on uh, Doppler and look for blood vessels. We can assume it's solid and try to characterize it. We can do elastography, we can attempt to aspirate, or we can do ultrasound and get a DAV. I, I really don't like the attempt at aspiration as the first line of uh, defense because if it doesn't aspirate completely, then we're obligating ourselves to go to biopsy for something that's almost certainly going to be benign. In this particular case, we've turned on color Doppler, and there's a lot of internal vascularity, which indicates immediately that this is not just a complicated cyst. This is either an intracystic uh, papillary lesion, um, virtually filling the whole cyst, or, or a solid mass. Here I'm showing a shear wave elastogram for a complicated cyst on the left versus a fibroadenoma on the right. Notice that the fibroadenoma turns blue because it's solid and transmits shear waves. But uh, when it's a complicated cyst simulating a solid nodule, we get black in the center because no matter how viscous the fluid, uh, it won't transmit shear waves. Um, now, if you, you know, that's shear wave elastography. You can use strain elastography and on certain uh, machines like uh, the, the GE, you can get this trilaminar blue, red, uh, green appearance. And on other um, strain elastography machines, um, you can get this uh, bullseye appearance. Um, so, you know, depending on whether you have strain or shear wave elastography, which machine you have, there's various ways that you can help distinguish a complicated cyst with echogenic fluid from a, a solid mass. Now, if we assume it's solid and try to characterize it, these are almost always going to characterize as probably benign. They're going to be round or oval shaped, have a thin capsule, and it's going to have enhanced sound transmission. If we do try to predict whether it'll aspirate or not, uh, I, I, there's nothing uh, I found <clears throat> that's going to help us in all cases. You know, there's three possibilities. It might not be aspiratable at all. It might be partially aspiratable or completely aspiratable. This on the right could be a solid mass like a fibroadenoma. It could be a papilloma completely filling a cyst. It could be a complicated cyst with echogenic fluid. It could be a cyst filled with papal or papillary or metaplasia. Uh, it could be a cyst filled with uh, fatty fluid uh, and, and partially filled with apical metaplasia. So there's all sorts of possibilities. Um, and, and, you know, you can't always tell. So this looks like a classical fibroadenoma, but I put a needle in and it aspirated completely. This was, this was a complicated cyst with echogenic fluid that was simula <coughs> simulating a fibroadenoma. Once we've um, put a needle into a cyst and it doesn't aspirate, this could be because the fluid's simply too viscous to come through the needle or because it's filled with um, a solid nodule or is a solid nodule. And so in this case, um, you know, I got a failure to aspirate. What I'm going to try to do is rotate the tip of the needle forward and backward within the cyst um, in order to uh, um, determine whether this is solid or not. So here you can see it failed to aspirate. The tip of my needle is exactly halfway between the front and back wall shown by the pink arrows. And now I've rotated the tip of the needle back and all I've done is move the entire needle posteriorly so much so that I'm indenting the pectoralis muscle, but the tip of the needle is absolutely fixed. This is indicating that it's a solid mass. On the other hand, here I failed to aspirate but I can easily move the tip of the needle from the back to the front wall of the cyst. This is indicating that this is either merely viscous, proteinaceous, or fatty fluid, or that it's apricot metaplasia, which uh, is attached, but is uh, not offering any resistance to the movement of the tip of the needle. So here I've rocked the tip of the needle to the front of the cyst, and here I've rocked it to the back. Now in doing that, what I can do is break off apricot snouts and get some aspirate that I otherwise couldn't get. So basically what this could represent is a failed aspiration turning into a successful uh, FNA. So I can either get a cellular debris or I can get these apricot snouts which would tend to confirm that it's just papillary apricot metaplasia. Now part of the reason I don't like to go straight to aspiration is that if I don't aspirate completely then I've obligated myself to go on to oh, ultrasound get a vacuum assisted biopsy. Here. So here was a um, complex cystic and solid mass, uh, and I was able to partially aspirate, but I had a residual, and so then I had to put a vacuum probe in and go ahead and take out the, the remaining thing. So, 
It's part of the reason I don't like aspiration as my uh, first line of business. Now, what I have noticed is that the echogenicity of these indeterminate cystic and solid lesions can vary during the menstrual cycle. So if my partner saw it um, during the preovulatory phase of the menstrual cycle, it may have been more echogenic and more similar to a solid mass. Whereas if I get her in for a biopsy, if she gets scheduled for a biopsy, and I'm the one doing the biopsy, but she comes in in the post ovulatory phase, there's more fluid in there and it looks more clearly to be um, complicated cystic to me. So, um, you know, these aspirations that I do of, not, of indeterminate cystic versus solid are usually because the patient's already been scheduled for a solid mass. And when I look at it, I say, really? That doesn't look solid. I think that's a complicated cyst. Simply because of the varying amount of, uh, of fluid that can be within these cysts during the menstrual cycle. So that's the main reason I do these aspirations to cancel a biopsy that I didn't think was necessary. So if I can't classify something as BIRADS 2 or 3, then I have to go back to calling it BIRADS 4 and I have to biopsy it. Now, it's important that we use the rule of multiplicity. So this is a single field of view in a patient in whom every field of view look like this. And what she has is a debris level in cyst 1, uh, uh, acorn cyst caused by apricot metaplasia in cyst 2, um, a fat fluid level floating in the anterior part of the cyst in, in cyst 3, and an indeterminate cystic versus solid in 4. So basically, if, if any of these is a dominant palpular mammographic abnormality, I'm going to probably go up and call it a BIRADS 3. But if I see multiple incidental complicated cysts or, or non-simple cysts, uh, like on a screening or ABUS study, you know, I'm going to use rule, rule of multiplicity to downgrade them to BIRADS 2 as, as much as possible. So, you know, the take-home points are that many benign cysts appear to be non-simple. Most non-simple breast cysts are uh, benign and part of the fibrocystic spectrum. Harmonics and spatial compounding are useful in distinguishing pseudo non simple cysts from real non simple cysts. Suspicious findings are those that make a cyst complex, mis mixed cystic and solid rather than complicated. Um, and uh, if they are present, we should go straight to vacuum biopsy, I think. I don't think core biopsy or cyst aspiration are the appropriate things to do. There are lots of technical tricks to prove definitively benign findings, including Doppler, acoustic radiation, force scintillating echoes, color streaming, position change, power um, Doppler vocal fremitus, elastography, and manipulation of the needle during attempted aspiration. And finally, the rule of multiplicity can be helpful in assigning barriers too in some situations. Thank you.